The Comics Code Seal of Approval, a symbol which I'm sure we are all familiar with, one which is very controversial and was very ubiquitous in the comic book world for a very long time. Most people look at the symbol today as a vestige of oppression from a time when comic book creators were limited in their creativity. But let's stop and look at this symbol and think for a second. Without the Comics Code authority, the Marvel Universe as we know it today probably would have never existed. How you ask? We'll find out today. Hello all my friends and haters of the Comics Code Authority, Dante D here with another video and welcome to the channel where we talk about comic books and other geek stuff. If you're new to the channel today, I welcome you with open arms, thank you for stopping by. Please consider subscribing and check out the channel for other videos on topics related to geek culture. And after you've watched this video today and you've binge watched the other videos on the channel, please follow the channel on Twitter and Instagram at GeekeryD for news, updates, and cool tidbits on geek culture. So as mentioned in the intro today, we're going to be talking about how the Comics Code Authority led to the rise of the Marvel Universe. You're probably thinking, I'm out of my mind right now, and you're probably asking yourself, Dante, how is that possible? The Marvel Universe and all the characters in the Marvel Universe were revolutionary and they changed the way we looked at comics. How could the Comics Code Authority, an organization that limited the creativity of comic book creators, lead to the rise of such a revolutionary world? Well, bear with me and let's get to answering that question. So the Marvel Universe as we know it today has only been around since the 1960s. Marvel Comics did exist before the 1960s, but they had a different name. They were called Timely Comics, which was a company that was publishing comics dating all the way back to the Golden Age in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Back in the Golden Age, Marvel had some success with some of their flagship characters that even exist today, like Captain America, the Human Torch, and Namor. They became really popular by doing stories relating to World War II because World War II was the talk of the time and every single comic book publisher was doing World War II related stories. All superheroes went to war, Superman went to war, uh, Namor went to war, and Captain America, in fact, in his first appearance on the cover of Captain America Comics number one is Captain America depicted punching out Adolf Hitler. After the end of the Second World War, superheroes lost their relevance. The war was won. People didn't need superheroes anymore, so they started turning to other genres like westerns and crime comics and horror comics. Some of these heroes disappeared temporarily and returned in the Silver Age of comics but others were lost forever. It was other comic book genres that were really kicking during this time. I mentioned a few of them before. Westerns, romances, teenage dramas. During this time, Marvel Comics really struggled to stay relevant as they experimented with different genres and attempted to keep up with other publishers who were experiencing great success with horror comics and crime comics and sci-fi, notably EC Comics. Martin Goodman, the then publisher of Marvel Comics, had a business model in which he was playing a little bit of follow the leader. Goodman's publishing strategy included following trends in TVs and westerns and drive-in monster movies. Whatever was popular at the time, he would publish a comic book about it. Now, the short-term results were really lucrative, but he found that these books were not viable long-term. Some of the books that were popular with Marvel at the time were A Date with Millie, Astonishing, Mystic, Tales to Astonish, Strange Tales, all these books here. Some of them were books which that introduced us to a lot of the characters that we see in the Marvel universe today, and others were just kind of short-term, superficial type books that were cheap thrills and just really lasted only a short period of time. There was a time when Marvel was even kind of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with EC Comics with the publication of horror comics, and a lot of different publishers got into the publishing of horror comics, and it got a little bit out of hand to the point where the covers that were being produced on horror comics were getting the attention 
of certain people, notably Frederick Wortham. And I've talked about Frederick Wortham in the past, I don't wanna to spend too much time on him, but basically what you need to know about him is he writes this book about the effects of comic books on young minds, and he basically said that comic books were destroying the moral fiber of society, and they were destroying youth, and comic books were contributing to juvenile delinquency. While Dr. Wortham was a psychiatrist and people, of course, listened to him, well, ultimately what this led to was the beginning of the Comics Code Authority, a self-governing censorship body that looked at comics and made sure that they weren't going to offend anybody or they weren't going to rot the minds of any young people reading these books. With all the bad publicity that comic books were getting from Frederick Wortham and this new Comics Code Authority, the comic book business almost crashed and burned. With the beginning of the Comics Code Authority, stories got really boring, at least in my opinion. You really could see how the creators were being limited in their creativity after the com the Comics Code Authority was, was instituted. I've read a few comics from, from the time period and I have to say they are just so dry and boring and really kind of one to two dimensional like they're they're just terrible let me know what you think about some of the stories um from the comics codes early days in the comments i'd really love to know what you guys think because i personally thought um they were terrible stanley himself even has admitted in the past how difficult it was to be a comic book creator after the comics code authority was instituted it was just very difficult he even says that he just got tired of doing the same old crap to the point where he almost quit. I had been doing these comics for about 20 years or so, and I really had had it up to here. I felt I want to quit and try something else. He said they were doing the same old westerns, same old monster type books. He says he was thinking uh, about anything that sounded like a sound, and he would give, give that name to a monster for, for, for that week. I would make up a name like Gru or Mungor or anything that was a sound and Jack would make a story out of it any way he wanted and I'd put in the, the insipid copy. And it just became really monotonous and he didn't find any value in what he was doing. But before he quit, his wife convinced him to do a book the way he wanted to do it. A book that was maybe for uh, a population or, or a readership that was, had a little bit of a higher IQ, not necessarily children. She said, well, why don't you just once do a book the way you would like to do it instead of the way they want you to do it? She's like, well, you're going to quit anyway. Just do it. You all know that if you want to be successful in a particular genre, you can't just play follow the leader. You have to shake things up. You got to be daring. You got to try to be revolutionary. Well, Stan Lee knew this, and he thought, if I'm gonna make this comic book company work, I'm really gonna have to get creative here. So when Stan Lee was forced to be creative, he gave us the Fantastic Four, and that was the birth of the Marvel Universe. The Fantastic Four was extremely popular, and what followed was a line of superheroes that were for a more intelligent audience. A line of superheroes that were more realistic in a way, that had an extra added human component to them, so for readers to be able to better identify with them. These types of superheroes at the time were unheard of. The idea of a character with powers having struggles and struggling to lead dual lives as superheroes and people or struggling with their, with their powers, this was just really new. Stanley saw this and he continued to create characters in this manner. Soon enough, these characters started having guest appearances in each other's books to the point where it became apparent that all of these characters were existing within the same universe. This was also something that was never really done before. I mean, DC did it a little bit with the whole Batman, Superman team-ups in, in some of their books in the, uh, in the 50s, but a universe as complex as the Marvel Universe was unprecedented. These new elements that Stan Lee was adding to comics not only helped Marvel rise in popularity and helped establish this well-known brand of Marvel Comics in the Marvel Universe, but it also translated to great sales figures. Let's think about it for a second. Say you're reading Spider-Man and you always read Spider-Man. Every single week you've been buying Spider-Man. Well, now the Fantastic Four makes an appearance in Spider-Man and you really like these characters. So you're like, hmm, I wanna check out this Fantastic Four and then you go and check out their books. Then the next time 
you read Spider-Man, the Black Panther or the Hulk appears in the Spider-Man story, and you're, you've never been exposed to them, and you're thinking, oh, I like these characters. So now you're going out and you're picking up their books. It became to a point where people were buying every single book from the Marvel line of comics just to be able to keep up with what was going on in the universe. So with all that information in mind, you kind of have to sit back and wonder, would the Marvel Universe as we know it today have existed without the institution of the Comics Code Authority? Stan Lee was forced to get really creative and, and create something really revolutionary because of the restrictions that were in place by the Comics Code Authority. I often wonder myself, had the Comics Code never happened, had the Frederick Wortham thing never happened, would Marvel have continued playing follow the leader? Would they continue that publishing strategy of just making books about what was popular at the time and following what other publishers were doing? I mean, they were having some success. I mean, success enough to stay in business. Sadly, this is something that we will never know unless our universe somehow gets relaunched, just like DC and Marvel relaunch their entire universes and we go back and the comics code never happens and Frederick Wortham never happens, then we can possibly see what would have happened. What are your thoughts on the matter? Do you feel that the Marvel Universe would have happened anyway, even without the Comics Code Authority and the whole Frederick Wortham thing? Or do you feel that the Comics Code Authority, at least indirectly, was an integral part in the beginning of the Marvel Universe? Please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear your opinion and your thoughts on this matter. Until next time, this is Dante D signing off. I will see you all in the next episode.